Okay, that should be on track. Okay, this is where we ended up at this animation, and I love this animation. Let me hit play. <laughs> So med school in Utah put this up, but you can hit play on this. As you're watching, you can pause it anywhere you want. You can stop it. You can see the blood flowing. You can see the different valves that are open. Like right now, what valve is open? The right AV, which is also known as the tricuspid. So the tricuspid's open right now, which means what do you know about the pressures? You've got a pressure in the ventricle and a pressure, pressure in the atria. Which one has to be higher if that valve is open? has to be the atria, high pressure to low pressure. So if you imagine just numbers, you can write all over the next exam all you want. So you can doodle, you can draw little pictures. I like drawing little square cubes with four boxes when I do heart, anytime I've taken any kind of heart exam. That way I can write pressures in the different areas and I know exactly where everything's flowing. Um, so up here, if I just wrote an imaginary number at 100, what do you know has to be, where does this number have to be? has to be less than 100. I could put it at 99. I could put it at 1. It doesn't matter. As soon as this is lower than this, that valve opens. What about when this starts squeezing? What phase do we call that when it starts squeezing? It starts with an S. Systole, right? So it's going through the systolic phase. It's starting to contract. As soon as this pressure goes up to 101, if this one's 100, what happens to that valve? It shuts. The pressure tries to go backwards, but the valve prevents it from going back. So it snaps that door shut. What if this is now 101, but that valve is still shut? What's that telling you about the pressure in the, in the artery that's going out? It's higher pressure in the artery. So if it's 102 or 120, and this is 101, this is trying to push backwards, but it can't because what's in the way? A valve, and the valve snaps shut. When we look at the heart, we typically discuss the left side because we can measure the left side. When you're checking somebody's pulse, it's the left side you're checking. When you're checking, checking their blood pressure, it's the left side. Why are we not measuring the, left, or the right side's pressure directly? Where's it going? It's going to the lungs. What do you know about the pressure in the right side compared to the left, though? It's got to be lower because how far is it pumping first? Right next door. And if you had high pressure, what would happen to all those little tiny alveoli in your lungs that you learn about? You'd blow those suckers apart. You have to have low pressure in the pulmonary circulation, high pressure in the uh, systemic circulation. So a lot of things we already talked about last week, I'm kind of going over again. But like I was saying, when you, when you play this thing, you can look. It shows you a line of exactly where it's at in the, in the different parts of the cardiac cycle. It can show you exactly where you're at on ECG. It shows you the heart sounds. It shows you where you are on pressures and volumes. It even tells you what phases you're in, whether you're systole or diastole, and then what stage of it you're in. If you want tutorials to walk through it, they're all listed here, so it can help walk you through it. So if you want, you can step by step. We'll just click that until we get the very beginning of the P. So the P, what's the P representing? Atrial depolarization. So look, the atria is starting to depolarize here, and it's starting to contract across the top. If I step along, dink, Tink, tink. You can see it's squeezing. If you look at the pressures, I should probably put my glasses back on. So let's see, atrial pressure here. If you look at the atrial pressure, you can see as the atria is squeezing, the pressure is rising. Look on the ECG. What phase are you in on ECG? You're in the PR segment, which is electrically, what do you know about the PR segment? segment? It's AV node delay. But what's happening to the atria during the AV node delay? Mechanically, it's contracting, it's squeezing. Depolarization was the P wave, that's over. It, mechanically, it's squeezing, but you don't see the mechanical movement on ECG, you see the electrical movement. And you have to remember electrical versus mechanical. So autorhythmic cells or electrical cells, electrical activity, where contractile, the squeezing, the actual forcing and squeezing, that's a mechanical function. You don't see that in the electrical phases. So here you can see this thing squeezing. As it's squeezing, the pressure is obviously going to do what? increase. As you squeeze on anything, you increase the pressure on it. So it raises the pressure. It's going to raise until it exceeds what pressure? Atrial pressure is trying to exceed ventricle. And you can see at this point, it has. It's exceeded the ventricle pressure and you've opened this valve and you pushed it in. You can step along. You can see that's atrial systole. Step, step. Uh-oh. Look what happened. What's the valve doing? Shutting because what's happening with the pressures? When they're equal, it's open, so what's happening here? 
muscle contraction in the ventricle doing what to the pressure here? It's increasing it. So as soon as it starts squeezing, it increases over the atria. What do you know has to happen to that valve? It shuts. So snap, it's shut. Look at both valves. They're both closed because the ventricular pressure is higher than the atria, but the arteries pressure is higher than the ventricle. What phase do you call that? It's in contraction, right? It's the systole. There's no volume change, so it's called isovolumetric ventricular contraction. And it says it right there. During systole, you can look, isovolumetric contraction. And you keep going along until you finally exceeded the pressure in the artery. What's going to happen? Yep, the valve opens, and you can watch the pressures here. There's the artery's pressure. There's the ventricle's pressure rising, 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 rising. And at this point right here, when they meet up, bink, the valve opens. You can see the pressures meet. The valves open. Rapid ejection. Click, 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 click. So I love this because it's just a living picture of that slide that's in your book. And you can watch it over and over. You can watch the web and the dub. Do you remember what causes the lub? Yep, and if you can't remember, we'll stop it right there before the first heart sound. Whoops, step back just a little bit. So right here, boom, boom, what's closing? The AV valve is closing, watch. Right here where it snaps, you're gonna see that heart sound pop. There's the lub. Dick, 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 dick. And we're just before the dub, what's gonna happen? Yep, watch the semilunars. Snap. There's the dub. Can you program that so that you pick up different uh, rhythms to it? This thing? Yeah. So I haven't ever looked that far. Yeah. You, yeah, you can play around with it. Have a blast playing with it. I think it's an awesome. Whatever you want to call it, animation, I guess. Okay, so play with it. And I don't think we asked this question last time. In order for the semilunar valve to open, which has to be true? So if you have to draw your little four boxes that show the ventricles and the atria. So how about this first one? For the semilunar valve to open, what has to be true? Atrial pressure has to be higher than aortic pressure. Do you ever need that? Are the atria and the aorta connected? Not at all. You can cross that one out. How about the ventricle pressure has to be higher than the aortic pressure? So what's the name of the valve between the ventricles and the aorta? It's a semilunar. If the ventricle is higher, then it pops that valve open. That's the right answer. Double check number three and four. Aortic pressure has to be higher than ventricular pressure. If the aortic pressure is higher than the ventricle, where does it want to go? It wants to go into the ventricle. What valve stops that? Semilunar, right? So aortic pressure, the artery is trying to push into the ventricle. That's a semilunar valve. That one's wrong. How about atrial pressure has to be higher than ventricular pressure? What happens if the atrial pressure is higher than the ventricular pressure? The AV valve opens, but what's the question asking? Semilunar. So this could be a true statement if this word were different. For this question, it's wrong, though. So 1, 3, and 4, we know are wrong. It has to be number 2. How about this? And I'm putting a couple questions in here just as a, you might want to look forward to some questions like that. Is that you, God? That was a test. Who called that number to see if I was going to turn my head that way? <laughs> yeah, I can go back. Was there a question you had on the, this question? Or you just want to look at it again? Okay. All right, so the next one. If the ventricular pressure is higher than atrial pressure but lower than aortic pressure, this one, you would definitely want to draw something. Thank you. So the first thing I want to write down is if the ventricular pressure, so ventricle, I'm going to set this up real quick. Ventricle pressure is higher than atrial pressure. So I'm going to assign a number. Ventricle pressure, we're going to say, is 100. Atrial pressure, what do we want to give that one? Anything that's under 100. So ventricle pressure is higher than atrial, so we can say that that one's 80. We'll give, give it a high pressure, really high. But lower than aortic pressure. So the ventricular pressure is lower than the aortic pressure. Let's give a number to the aorta. Say 120, right? So ventricle pressure is lower than aortic pressure. We gave the ventricle 100, so we have to give some number higher. 
Right, which of the following is true? At this point, I'm going to switch over so you can look at the document cam and how I set the question up. Really? Huh? Oh, man. No, actually, I was late because I was up in the lab. And you know how miserable going up and down stairs are? I almost used the elevator in Mercy for the first time ever. Okay. So I set it up. Remember, compare the ventricular pressure. I assigned it to 100, so we'll say millimeters of mercury. You don't have to write this, but I'm just giving you the example so it's more detailed. And then remember, the atrial pressure was lower, so I assigned it 80, but the aortic pressure was higher, so I assigned it 120. What do you know is true about this valve? First, what is this valve? It's the AV valve, right? What do you know about the AV valve? It's closed. It's closed. So this one's completely shut. What do you know about this valve? What is this valve? It's a semilunar. What do you know about it? Also closed. So what do you know before you even look at the options? AV closed, semilunar closed, what phase are you probably in? ISO, volume, ventricle. It, I would almost guess contraction, but it could technically be relaxation too. The point is here, what's happening in that ventricle? It's exactly the same volume. It's exactly the same volume. So you're looking for some kind of an answer that says that the valves are closed, right? Let's see what our choices are. Number one, AV valve is open. What do you know? Nope. Absolutely not. How about number two, AV valve and simulator valve were both closed. Yes. That one looks true to me. How about this one? AV valve and simulator valve are open. No. Nope. How about the AV valve is closed but the simulator is open? No. Absolutely not. So you figured it out. And I took a little bit extra time writing millimeters of mercury and writing everything down. But if you just put a little box over to the side and look at the pressures, it should be able to tell you what's going on. Thank you. Okay, effects of the parasympathetic stimulation on the heart. Automatically, what should you think? Parasympathetic wants you, your heart to do what? Relax, right? What's it going to do to your heart rate? Slow it down. Slow it down. What's it going to do to the contractility? Make it weaker. So it's going to weaken it. Your heart normally beats faster. If you took your brain out of the equation, you have a faster heart rate. It's the parasympathetic nervous system that's slowing it down and saying, hey, we've got like 80 years of life here. Take your time. So the parasympathetic decreases heart rate by keeping the potassium channels open. In other words, it's keeping it more close to the repolarization phase, more of a relaxation phase. So if the potassium channels are open, but remember the calcium channels over here, potassium's racing out. If I keep more potassium channels open, it's going to kind of keep it balanced out. It's going to make it harder for you to do hit what dotted little line? Threshold. Threshold. Remember, I'm not changing the amounts of calcium. I'm changing the doorways that it can move. Last week on Thursday, we talked about what happens if I put more potassium in your blood. What did that cause? Yeah, arrhythmias, tachycardia, it causes lots of problems, potentially clinically dead, right? So it could kill you. Potassium chloride, remember high levels of potassium in your blood could kill you. This is the channels. This is the doorways. Your levels in the body are all normal. All you're doing is opening the door just a little bit longer to let a little bit more potassium go out, which, which slows down depolarization. Right? Second, the time between the atrium and ventricular contraction is stretched out. So if the time between the atria and the ventricle contracting, what's that changing? Blood pressure or heart rate? It's affecting your heart rate, it's slowing down your heart rate a little bit. And then the atrial contraction is going to be weaker. It's a softer contraction. Yep. OK. And then the, when you look at the nerve, the vagus nerve comes down. An interesting thing about like dogs, I don't know much about cats. I'm not a big cat fan. But with dogs, if they get a little bit excited, if you rub them right over the, the clavicle, the collarbone, it stimulates the vagus nerve. You're stimulating their parasympathetic nervous system. What are you doing to them? Relaxing them. Relaxing them. You're calming down their heart rate. 
All right, effects of sympathetic stimulation on the heart. Oh, wait, before I go on. Actually, if you look, the vagus nerve, look where it's controlling. It's con controlling the, what node up here? SA, what's the one in between? The AV. Is, is the parasympathetic nervous system affecting the ventricles? No. All right, next, effects of sympathetic stimulation on the heart. Sympathetic, you should automatically think. Faster heart rate, what about the contractility? A firmer contraction. But instead of this one focusing on the atria, the firmer contraction is going to be the ventricles. So it increases heart rate by decreasing potassium permeability, which means it's making it easier for you to hit what? Threshold. Yep, it's letting more calcium in than potassium out, so you hit threshold a lot faster. So it decreases the delay between the atrial and ventricular contractions, which means that your heart rate's going to go a little bit closer together. The P, if you watch the P and the QRS, they're going to be a little bit more close. What's the name of that segment that's going to be closer together? Between the P and the QRS. The PR segment, right? So it's making a, a slower delay or a shorter delay. And then decreased contraction time throughout the heart. Look where look where your sympathetic stimulation is going. It goes up to the SA node, it goes to the AV node, it goes down to the ventricles. It's affecting the whole heart. Bless you. And then this one I'm hoping you should already know. If it's increasing your heart rate and it's increasing your heart um, strength, your contractility strength, what ion do you want to pay really close attention to? Calcium. And that's why what do they prescribe for people that have a strong and excessively strong heart rate a calcium channel blocker, right? Because there's too much calcium going in. So they give them the blocker and it slows down it going in, which means it's gonna, it's gonna slow down their heart rate, the depolarization. But also it has less calcium for actin and myosin, remember? So you have what's gonna happen to the contractions. Not as strong, they're gonna be a little bit weaker. Okay, so here's some examples. In this situation, if the dotted line is a normal heart rate, what situation do we have up here? Faster or slower? slower? Yep, it's slower. So if you normally would have two heartbeats in this time, you only have one, that's going to be a lot slower. What nervous system component is doing this? Parasympathetic. What channel are you actually affecting here? Potassium channels. Yep. So what are you doing? Blocking them up or leaving them open? You're leaving them open a little bit longer. Yep. So opening a little bit more potassium channel. In this situation, there's normal two heartbeats. What's this? Sympathetic. Yep, it's a faster heart rate. What could you be doing to the potassium channels? You could be blocking them. If this was leaving them open longer, just the opposite for sympathetic, you could be blocking them. But what ion do you really want to focus on? Calcium. What's happening to the calcium channels? More open, right? So you get what's going to happen to your contractility rate? Faster. What's going to happen to the contractility pressure? Squeeze harder. Man, I'm usually really animated in the heart section, and that just hurts like hell. No dancing today. Yeah, I thought about it. I chose against it. Keep your fingers crossed for Thursday. I heard there's supposed to be like 10 inches to a, a so foot of test, snow. So then the test would be Yeah, if, if we're not here on Thursday, there's no way the test would be on time. Yeah, so please don't pull out your voodoo dolls and start stabbing me in the neck, because I have a feeling somebody already did that today. I actually thought that this morning. I was like, man, wouldn't it be clever? That would be funny. But I never thought of that when I was in school. Dang it. Who wouldn't sell their soul for, soul for one extra day of study, right? So stroke volume. Stroke volume is determined by the extent of venous return and by sympathetic activity. Venous return is talking about the blood flowing back into the heart. And I talked about three things that affect your heart, your stroke volume, I talked about preload, I talked about contractility, and afterload. What was venous return talking about? Was it preload, afterload, or contractility? It's preload. Preload, the venous return is how much you're pushing back into the heart before it actually gets a ch chance to contract. Does that affect in systolic or in diastolic volume? The venous return, how much you put into the heart before the heart gets a chance to beat. In diastolic, what is diastole? It's relaxed. It's when it's completely relaxed. 
So if you're pushing more blood in when it's completely relaxed, you're changing that in diastolic. And the second thing is by a sympathetic activity. Sympathetic, you want to think of heart rate and contractility of the ventricles. Do either of those things have anything to do with stroke volume? What does, does heart rate have anything to do with stroke volume? How about contractility? What is stroke volume? Your heart rate times how much you squeeze out in one heartbeat. It has everything to do with both components of the sympathetic activity on the heart. The sympathetic activity is a powerful controller of stroke volume. So if I had a normal stroke volume like we looked at last week, 135 and then 65 for my end systolic, that's my 70 milliliter stroke volume. What was our heart rate we used last week? 70 beats a minute. So what was, if I take the heart rate times the stroke volume, what do I come up with? 4,900 milliliters for what? What's that? Per minute, which is called cardiac output, right? So if I change and I squeeze harder, I increase the contractility, I squeeze, I squeeze more blood out at one time. What's doing that? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? Sympathetic. Imagine I'm jumping on a treadmill, right, and I'm running. My heart's going to squeeze harder so I can get more oxygenated blood to those tissues. So I was at 65, I dropped it down to 35. Now my stroke volume's already gone up to 100 milliliters. Is systolic just going to control, or is uh, sympathetic just going to control my contractility? Nope. It's going to contract my heart rate too. So what if I change this to 100 beats per minute? What's my new cardiac output? Stroke volume times heart rate, number of beats per minute, it would be 10,000 milliliters. That's 10 liters of blood. How much do you have in your body if you're a woman? About five. If you're a man, you're at about five and a half. All right? The next thing that's going to change is when you start relaxing the heart a little bit harder. And that seems really weird, relaxing harder. What you're actually doing is you're squeezing the veins. And what are the veins doing? Are they pushing the blood backwards down to the system? Why? Why can't they push backwards? Because the valves, what are they doing to the heart? They're making it relax harder, right? So it's relaxing more extensively. What's it doing to its fill volume? It's filling up more, exactly. You're squeezing more in. As soon as I s stimulate the blood vessels with sympathetic nervous system, they squeeze harder. It raises my blood pressure, right? It's going to squeeze more blood into my heart. So I'm actually raising my end diastolic volume too. Look at that stroke volume now. What did I just do to it from back here? I jumped on a treadmill and I doubled my stroke volume. What happened to my heart rate? Went up. We're saying 100 beats a minute. So you're, you're cruising along, right? A nice 100 beats a minute. What's your new stroke volume or your new cardiac output? 14,000 milliliters. That's about 14 liters. That's almost three times what you pump at resting stage. All right. So sympathetic nervous system, when you look at the intrinsic control, you want to know what the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic. In the first day of class, I told you you have to know this. Intrinsic means whatever organ you're looking at, it's the organ doing the control. Extrinsic, what would be two really good extrinsic controllers of the heart? The nervous, nervous system and the endocrine system. Yep. Nervous and endocrine, two powerful extrinsic controllers. So intrinsic control of, of stroke volume is the heart controlling the stroke volume. Frank Starling, he's kind of like Fick. They look at these common sense type of things and then they get their name stuck onto it. But Frank Starling, he says that the heart pumps all the blood return to it, so an increase in end diastolic volume results in increased stroke volume. The easiest way to think of this is what comes in must go out. If you push more blood into the heart, what's the heart going to have to do? It has to push harder to get all that blood back out. You don't build up the blood. If you kept if you kept building up the blood in the heart, what's going to eventually do? Explode, right? So wherever you pump in, you have to pump out. So he has this nice little graph that shows that the more that you're actually pushing in, the more you're pushing out. So it, based on Frank Starling's law, if you increase your EDV, what's EDV? End diastolic volume. What will happen to your stroke volume? Yep, so if you increase what goes in, you increase what goes out, which is your stroke volume. Stroke volume is defined as what? The amount the heart pumps in. One cardiac cycle, one beat, yep. 
And then the extrinsic control, I already gave you the two good examples, or actually you gave me the two good examples. But the sympathetic nervous system, if it's a sympathetic nervous system, what's it going to do to your heart rate? Faster. What's it going to do to your heart contractility? <coughs> Beat harder, exactly. So you get a more complete ejection. Do you pump all of the blood out of the heart? No. You just pump more out. Anybody remember what that was called? Cardiac reserve. So if you like the little flow or the little flow charts like this, sympathetic activity, venous return, what's it doing to the veins? It's squeezing the smooth muscle, causing them to squeeze down. They pump more blood where? Back towards the heart. So then that raises your end diastolic volume. Sympathetic nervous system also controls the contraction of the heart, which makes it do what? Squeeze harder. So increasing your stroke volume overall. Okay, so if we start looking at that little flow chart on the last slide, and then we mix it with the one before that had the parasympathetic and sympathetic, you can see sympathetic does it just control your volume. Nope, it controls your volume and it controls your heart rate. So overall, it controls cardiac output. Okay, next, arterial blood pressure, the afterload. This is what's pushing back on the heart. Is this sentence in your notes? Okay, so we're composed on the heart after contraction has begun. What's your left ventricle trying to do? It's trying to generate enough pressure to overcome the, the what's the thing on the other side of the valve? The artery. It's trying to overcome the artery. So if you're looking at the left side of the heart, what's the artery? Aorta. If you're looking at the right side of the heart, what is it? Pulmonary trunk, right, so pulmonary arteries. Afterload is those arteries saying, I'm so full of blood, I don't want any more. So they're squeezing and squeezing. That's the afterload. It's trying to push the blood back into the heart. Can it push it back into the heart? No, but what can it do? It can prevent the heart from opening it up. So afterload, if you have high blood pressure, what would that do to your afterload? Would it decrease the afterload and reduce the pressure going back into the heart, or would it increase it? It increases it. So when you eat those three Big Macs and du two double cheeseburgers and wash it down with two McShamrock shakes, I had one of those yesterday. Not the same as when I was a kid. But it was like drinking Listerine in my ice cream. It was incredible. No. I loved them when I was a, when I was a kid. It was a tradition. My mom would take me and my brother to get one when they came out. Ugh, God, it was terrible. Back then it was delicious. But... Anyway, the afterload, when you have all that crap built up in your, your arteries, there's gunk, there's buildup, there are plaques that are forming, there's hardening around the outside walls. What's going to happen to its flexibility? It's going to decrease. So it's going to increase pressure on the blood because it's not very flexible. What's that going to do to your afterload? It's going to increase your afterload. If you increase the afterload, it's trying to push back into the heart from the wrong direction. The preload was trying to push from the veins in, the afterload was trying to push from where in? The arteries in. Is that normal? You don't want a ton of afterload. Oh. All right, so heart failure, winding down here. When you look at heart failure, primary defect in the heart, it decreases the contraction. If you have a damage to an area, and we kind of talked about this in the lab last week, if I have a heart attack over here on the left side, what's gonna to happen to the communication between those cells, like the Purkinje fibers. What if I damage one of those pathways? It's not going to contract exactly. That electrical activity going up the Purkinje fibers isn't going to move as efficiently. This part of my heart's not going to contract as well. If it's the left ventricle, what's going to happen to my stroke volume? It's going to have to go down. It has to go down, right? What's going to happen to the power of my contraction? It went down too, right? Which actually caused the stroke volume to decrease. So decreasing that contractility or the strength cause decreased stroke volume. They're not going to be able to pump as efficiently. Right? And the compensatory measure for heart failure, you're constantly trying to accommodate. So if your blood pressure starts dropping because your heart's not beating as hard, your sympathetic nervous system is going to kick in. What's it going to do to your blood vessels? To say, hey, if the heart's not creating the pressure, what are the blood vessels going to do? They're going to start squeezing. They're going to start raising your blood pressure by squeezing. They're going to try and compensate. 
sympathetic nervous system isn't something that lasts for a long, long time. It likes to go in short bursts to get you out of a bad situation. So as you're constantly stimulating this with adrenaline, what could eventually start happening? Your nervous system is going to start getting tired. Your adrenal gland that's releasing this epinephrine is going to start relaxing. It's going to say, man, I can't keep up. What's going to start happening to your blood pressure? It's going to start dropping. What's going to happen to your flow to your brain and other organs? It's going to start dropping. What's going to happen to your organs then? They're going to start failing. Yep. So that's one method. Another thing that your, your body is going to do to compensate is the kidneys are going to retain more salt and water. Think about this first. If your kidney stops pushing salt out, you're adding solute to your blood. What's going to chase that solute? Water. When you start adding salt and water, what's going to happen to your blood volume? It increases. What's going to happen to your blood pressure? It's going to go up. But it's not always a good thing, right? So it's going to, your kidneys are going to try and keep your blood pressure a little bit high. But the problem is now you have high blood pressure going all over the place, not just the heart. It's going to start causing some other damage. Like, do you want high blood pressure? Do you want all that pressure going into your lungs? Why? Little teeny tiny alveoli I can't handle that kind of pressure for very long. So in something like this, what's going to happen around the, the lungs? If you're pushing a lot of fluid in, it's going to start leaking into the lungs. What's that creating? It's creating fluid on the lungs or fluid in the tissue around the lungs, which is called pulmonary edema. So your heart, as it starts failing, your other body parts are going to start trying to accommodate. Are these good things? No, you get bad side effects when you push these for too long, and then eventually when this compensatory st measures stop, whoops, then you have decompensated heart failure. Now, you're not compensating. Your kidneys are done doing what they were supposed to be doing. They're going to start shutting down. They're not getting good, adequate blood flow. High pressure is damaging to the kidney, too, even though it's creating this it. This is over a period of years. Yep. This, it depends on how severe it is. Like, if somebody has a massive heart attack and, and their, their organs are trying to compensate really fast, you're going to see this progress quickly, a lot more quickly. But otherwise, yeah, if it's just you and me and we slowly have little tiny pieces of damage to our heart, it's going to be over years. So decompensated heart failure, we call it congestive heart failure. And congestive heart failure can happen to either side. It doesn't have to just be the left side. It can also be the right side of the lungs, or heart. I was thinking my next thing I want to say. If it's the right side, where's the right side normally pumping to? The lungs. If it's not pumping efficiently to the lungs, but the left side is pumping efficiently to the where? System. System. Are you pumping blood evenly anymore? No. no. Where's the blood building up? In the veins of what? Pulmonary or systemic circulation? The system. You're pumping more out to the system and you're pumping less into the lungs, so all that extra blood's going to the system. If somebody has right congestive heart failure, where would you see the edema primarily? In the legs, exactly. Why the legs? Because when they're standing on their feet all day, it's pulling it down to their feet and it's starting to pull around their legs. I remember my grandmother, when she was, before she died, she would always complain at the end of the night because her legs were so swollen, but when she got up in the morning, suddenly her legs weren't swollen. Did her heart get better in the night? No. What happened? She laid on her back, and the blood evenly distributed everywhere. So she actually had full systemic edema, but while she was at work all day, it started pooling again. Yeah. Don't say their name. The patient did to you? No, the, oh. the tech. <laughs> it's like, wow, that's cool. No, she was just chilling, but the tech was like, because she was very little bit, um, she was kind of trying to explain it. The tech or the patient? the patient? Okay. She was kind of trying to explain it to us as she was like going over it, but she didn't want to like say too much. There's something about being like, something about like being like, like the ventricle, like the normal range, like 55 to 75 or something. Are you talking about the ejection fraction that yeah. you mentioned the other day? Yeah. But Yeah, I'm. I'm all about the symptoms. It's it's interesting watching the symptoms because I teach pathophysiology too. And what's also interesting is that does one symptom always give you a, an accurate diagnosis? No. no. But when you have a pile of different symptoms, like how are they going to feel breathing wise? If they're not getting good circulation to their lungs, how are they going to feel? They're always going to feel out of breath. What are you going to notice about the edema at the end of the day? 
pooling around their legs. So there are some signs that maybe this is one of the things they're setting in. Huh? They could. Yeah, they could. It's potential. Um, and symptoms like that even. You can have overlap, like cancers around the lungs will cause the same problem with something like that. So there's a lot of overlapping. But if it's on the right side, then they're not pumping efficiently to the lungs. They're not going to get good oxygenated blood, and you're going to see edema in the system. If it's not, if it's a left congestive heart failure, where would you see it backing up at? In the lungs, right? So it's not pushing to the system, but the right side's pushing all this blood to the lungs. If that pressure and all that blood's accumulating around the lungs, it starts leaking, and what's it cause? Pulmonary edema, right. So you might hear more crackles or more fluid around the lungs. They're still going to have that problem like, ah, I feel short, you know, like I can't breathe, but you're going to hear more fluidy sounds. And that's congestive heart failure. You don't have to worry about the grass. And then coronary circulation. The coronary circulation, remember, is the blood circulation going to the heart tissue itself. The heart is filled with blood, but it's not actually providing nourishment to its, its own tissue. Remember, you have that Teflon, that slippery coating on the inside of the ventricle and the atria, so that blood can't penetrate into the, the muscle. So when it pumps from the left ventricle, the blood, out to the aorta, right at the beginning of the aorta, you have this little tiny blood vessel, the left coronary artery, that sends circulation down and around the outside. This is interesting. When do you think the coronary circulation actually gets to the heart? During diastole or during systole? Why diastole? That's the first thing I heard. Why would that be? The heart's done contracting. Think about it. When the heart's contracting, that muscle, it's all big and tense. It's like a, a bodybuilder flexing, right? If you put your finger under the bodybuilder's shirt here and they flex, what's going to happen to the blood in your finger? You squeeze it out. So during systole, when the heart's squeezing, what's it doing to the, the blood in the coronary circulation? It's squeezing it out, right? And then during diastole, suddenly the heart relaxes, it opens up these blood vessels, and that's when the nourishment comes in. When you're also looking, when is this valve going to be closed? During systole or diastole? Diastole. diastole. What's the blood trying to do? Race back in now, right? So during systole, I contract and I push the blood out into the aorta. And then during diastole, it's trying to race back. It comes down around here and goes down into the coronary circulation. So what, what problem could happen if you have a really fast heart rate and you shorten that TP. You're not, you're not relaxing completely and you're not allowing good circulation to the coronary circulation either. Here's some problems that can happen. Atherosclerosis is one. So in general, arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis are like umbrella terms for all the things that can build up or go wrong with your blood vessels, like hardening, accumulating plaques, and here's an example here, accumulating plaque. You eat that double cheese Big Mac thing with your McGriddle shake on top of it, whatever. And then that fat goes sliding up along here and it starts penetrating through. It's fat. These are cells. Can it get in the cells? It's fat. Can it get into a cell membrane? It's made out of phospholipids? Absolutely. So these fats go sliding along. They leak in and underneath the cells. These fats are foreign to your body, though. What's your body going to try and do? kill them, right? So you have those macrophages, which we'll talk about in lab today, that come cruising in. They eat things, right? Macrophage, big eater. They come cruising in here. They eat this up. They turn into this thing called a foamy cell, and the macrophages are actually creating a plaque. So they ate the fat. They digest the fat. They change the fat, and now they die there full of fat. And it's, it's building this big plaque underneath your blood vessel. So your blood vessel normally was all the way around here. This is 100% size. And now you've got like 60% of it occluded or blocked off. Now you've got this little 40% flow. What's going to happen if this is your coronary circulation getting to the heart muscle and suddenly you start exercising? This is not flexible material. Are you going to be able to open up the blood vessel and get good flow through? No. So you're going to have to depend on what you're already providing the heart. So if they start exercising on Thursday, they're out there shoveling their sidewalk, right? Trying to shovel the snow. And their heart's beating harder trying to get more <laughs> blood, right? What's going to happen to them? They're going to start feeling pain because the heart's not getting oxygen. It's building up lactic acid because it's using what process? Glycolysis, right? And they start feeling this pain. They go in, they sit down and relax. Their heart rate starts easing. They return the blood flow. And then what do they do? 
they go back outside, and then boom, they get the big one, right? So then they have a myocardial infarction that we talked about last week. Nope. Once the plaque's there, the plaque stays there. When you when you do things to try and change your lifestyle, you're just trying to prevent extra damage. If you want to fix that plaque, they actually send a balloon up through you, and they put that balloon here, and they go, and they smash the plaque. Did they get rid of it? No. No, they just compacted it more. Is all they did, and they bought you a little bit more time. They didn't. It's not a fix. It's a. It's basically a temporary crutch. Yeah. So when you're trying to change your diet and your lifestyle, you're actually trying to change those bad cholesterols that are floating through and causing this problem, or part of the cause of the problem. All right, next one, angina pectoris, that's chest pain. That's associated with a heart attack, yeah. And we talked about a heart attack last week. A th thrombosis, thrombosis is a clot building up there. So this is an example of thrombosis. You have, let's say you have a little bit of erosion to that blood vessel. You start sticking clots or plaques there on the outside this time. So the clot starts building. The bad thing is, you ever had big clumps of mud on your car? When you're pushing the water over the top of the mud, does it very clear very well? Not really. So where do you aim it? Right down there, right? If the blood starts aiming down here on this clot, what's it eventually going to do? Dislodge the clot. It's going to break the clot free. This is a large blood vessel. You always know what about blood vessels downstream. They get smaller. So then it goes down here and it blocks it up. This thrombus, if it's in location, it's called a thrombosis. You're blocking this up. All it takes is a little bit extra and then finally you have ischemia, which is decreased blood flow of that tissue. That tissue downstream is going to do what? Struggle and die. If that thing breaks free, the moment it breaks free, it's technically called an embolus. An embolus doesn't have to be a clot. If the embolus is a clot, they call it a thrombo embolus which means it's a clotting embolus. You can have a big pocket of air. Anybody go diving, scuba diving? Yeah. What do they call it when people come up too fast? Mm -hmm. The bins. It's called nitrogen narco or narcosis. Nitrogen bubbles are too big to normally get in your blood, but when you go down deep, they squeeze down, they get into your blood, they circulate, and you've come up quickly, they go boop, and they pop back up. If you get a big pocket of that gas built up, it can do exactly the same thing. It can cause a blockage right here. It's called an embolism. It can be if you break a leg and some of the yellow bone marrow gets into your blood and circulation, it's an embolus. It can come up and kill you. Season five, last episode of House. Watch it. <laughs> Crush syndrome. Um, trying to think of other good examples. In extreme situation, if embryonic fluid crosses the placenta, it can actually cause an embolus. Yep. Yeah, so with hyperbaric oxygen, they're actually trying to increase the oxygen pressure outside the body to get it in, which we'll talk about a little bit with pulmonary next time. But And they're trying to get the oxygen into the tissues faster, but unfortunately, you're right. The nitrogen will also shrink down too. Because hyperbaric just means hyper-increased. And what's barrow referring to? We talked about barometers, right? Pressure, yep. So it's squeezing all of the gases that are in that chamber down, including nitrogen. And that's, yeah, that's why they have to slowly come off of it. An embolus is anything that's traveling through the blood that could potentially block something. Okay. A thromboembolism is a specific type of embolus. Okay. And a thrombus is just a clot inside the blood vessel. Okay. So a where, where do you mean? Like on the heart? It's the, it's the dead tissue. It's not the actual embolus itself or the thrombus itself. It's the tissue that died. When it gets replaced with new tissue, that new tissue is a scar. It's just like when you get a cut. Um, it's not the clot that actually is the new tissue. The clot is just the protective covering, and then eventually you pick it off as a scab, even though you're, like your mother said, don't do it. But the clot itself, yeah, you can have the clot go away, but the damage, once the damage is there, it's permanent damage. So yeah, like um, thrombotic showers, is that what you were thinking, or embolic showers? Does she have a heart issue? Okay, long story. Right. 
yeah, it the embolisms are gone, but the scar tissue remains because the tissue where they were at died and it was replaced with scar tissue. It, just like your skin. I mean, if you damage this part of your skin, the clot's just there, but the clot goes away, but it leaves a scar underneath. It's the new tissue. Yeah. And it's the same thing with the heart. When you kill part of the heart, all that tissue that's downstream of that clot, the clot's way up here, but all this tissue downstream is dead, so it'll be replaced with scar tissue, which I think is the next, next one. So when we're talking about collateral circulation, and apparently some other people use it in a different format. Oh, sorry, did you have a question, Tiffany? For which one? It's the plaque. Yeah, it's a plaque. Well, no, it's a clot building up. The back here, this is atherosclerosis. This is the plaque underneath the endothelium. Maybe, yeah, I must not point that out. This is the endothelium, the Teflon coating. The fat particles actually go underneath and they get eaten up by macrophage and they create this plaque and the plaque just keeps pushing the endothelium further and further inward. So you still have that teflon -y area here, but it's also bumpy, which is dangerous. Where when you're talking about a thrombus, the thrombus is actually building up on the outside. So if you got a cut right here, if something damaged the inside of that artery, you get a clot there and that would be the thrombus accumulating. In this situation, you can actually have atherosclerosis and a thrombus. All those bumps, they're rough now. If, if platelets slam into that and they start accumulating a clot right here, it's the same situation. You've got the atherosclerosis plaque, but you've got a thrombus on the outside of it. If that thing peels free, it could actually block this area up. It's the clot. The thrombus is the clot. The atherosclerosis is the plaque. Yeah. Did, is that better? Okay. Oh, and then the collateral circulation. So if I get, uh, let's say I have an embolism that blocks up right here. Collateral circulation is everything that this would circulate to. So everything downstream, all the tissue that surrounds this circulation is called collateral. So if I got a little blockage here and I had a heart attack and they got me to the hospital right away and they, like on the way there they broke the clot and they busted the clot. And this has like poor circulation. It's not working very well. What could they do here maybe? A bypass. Yep, so they could actually take and bypass it. They could take one coming right off the aorta and go straight down here, a bypass. So they can circulate around. But if this clot's here for too long in this tissue, you know it's going to struggle. It's going to start turning on glycolysis that accumulates lactic acids. And if I don't get it fixed right away and recover the oxygen, what's going to happen to all of this tissue? It's dead. Yep. What's it become? Scar tissue. Look at that. Would you think that this one pro would probably live or die? Look at that. That's the whole left ventricle that, that died. If it blocked down here, then you have a smaller heart attack right in this area. You probably live through this, but what's going to happen to the elasticity of this area? Within the, yeah, it's not going to be able to fill appropriately. What about the contractility? It's not muscle anymore. Yep, it's scar tissue. It's not going to contract. So what's going to happen? You're going to change what pressure or what <laughs> volume going out of the heart and never beat. Your stroke volume is going to go down, yeah. That's collateral circulation. Okay. All right, so we finished number five. Yeah, number five. What do you need to do by the time we come in Thursday? Lecture quiz. Lecture quiz. Number five. Yeah, online lecture quiz number five. Go.